All right, I'll introduce you first, Jenna. So um, thank you everyone for joining us this morning for Jenna Club. Um, our first speaker is Jenna Malecki. She's an AMS, AMS pharmacist at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and a project officer with the guidance group at Melbourne Health. Her topic is improvement in antimicrobial prescribing in the plastics unit following the introduction of targeted AMS rounds. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Arjun. Um, morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to give a brief overview of kind of how we implemented these targeted AMS plastics rounds at the Royal Melbourne Hospital as a new initiative to help improve antimicrobial prescribing in this unit. So firstly, I thought I'd run through the usual way we conduct our AMS rounds at the Royal Melbourne. Um, so at RMH, we have AMS ward rounds four times a week, um, with each round going for about two hours. Um, and this also includes twice weekly dedicated ICU rounds. Uh, we have an electronic approval system for our restricted antimicrobials called Guidance MS. Um, and this is what we use to help identify and triage ward patients for AMS review. Um, we write our AMS recommendations in the progress notes, um, plus also contact the treating team if the recommendation is urgent. Um, we also conduct the National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey, or NAPS, um, each year, as well as some other audits um, when required. Um, so a bit of background on why we decided to implement these plastics rounds. Um, so from our 2018 NAPS results, um, we identified that the plastics unit didn't perform as well as the rest of the hospital with their antimicrobial prescribing. Um, and this is particularly in regards to the appropriateness and their compliance with guidelines. Um, so the top graph here shows their um, overall appropriateness. So for the plastics unit, um, it was sitting at around 31%. Um, and this is compared to the rest of the Royal Melbourne Hospital, um, which usually sits at around 80%, um, and the national average of 76%. Um, likewise, their compliance with guidelines um, was also much lower than the rest of the hospital, um, sitting at just 9%, um, compared to 75% for the rest of Royal Melbourne. Uh, so we then wanted to investigate a little bit further um, in regards to their surgical antibiotic prophylaxis, um, as there were several examples of inappropriate prescribing for this surgical prophylaxis, um, which was identified in the NAPS. Um, so for this audit, we use the surgical NAPS. Um, we audited 28 surgical episodes within the plastics unit um, and we ass assessed both pre and intra-op uh, prescribing as well as post-op prescribing. Um, so overall, prescribing was fairly good for the pre and intra-op surgical prophylaxis. So the top graph here shows they were 75% appropriate um, and the bottom graph shows that the pre and intra-op prescribing was 60% compliant with guidelines. Um, however, it was their post-op prescribing which wasn't done as well, um, with only 40% appropriate um, and 20% compliant with guidelines. Um, but do note that this was only for five um, surgical episodes that actually received post-op antibiotics for prophylaxis only. So the next steps was to discuss this with the plastics head of unit, um, who was very keen to improve um, the unit's results. Um, so through our discussions, we identified that one of the limitations of our current AMS round setup um, was that the patients under the plastics unit were often prescribed these non-restricted antimicrobials, so they weren't seen on our usual AMS rounds. Um, so our plan was to in introduce these dedicated and combined AMS and plastics ward rounds. Um, so these combined rounds were arranged at regular times, um, either once or twice a week. Um, the rounds involved the plastic registrar, um, our infectious diseases consultant, plus the registrar when they could attend, um, as well as the AMS pharmacist. Um, so during each round, we reviewed all the patients who were under the care of the plastics unit or who they were consulting on. The Plastics Reg would give us a brief summary of the patient um, and their current antimicrobials. And then we would go through and review their medication chart, pathology and microbiology results. Um, we would review both restricted and non-restricted antimicrobials, um, which kind of expanded on the scope of our usual AMS rounds. 
Um, so through these discussions, um, we'd go through the rationale for the choice of the antimicrobial um, and what the plastics team planned for duration. Um, we'd go through the recommendations in the therapeutic guidelines and also provide a bit of education. Um, these medication charts were often changed at the time of the round where possible. Um, so our rounds were conducted on the ward where the majority of the plastics patients were located. Um, but there were some outliers whose charts we didn't have access to or patients in theatre um, at the time of the round. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were assessing whether the rounds were being effective. Um, so to do this, we prospectively collected data on our rounds, um, including the recommendation details, and these are all entered into Guidance MS. Um, and we were then able to develop some reports on the types and number of recommendations that we were making. Uh, we were also fortunate to have some students with us, um, so they did a retrospective audit on the acceptance of our recommendations made during this round as well. So on to the results. Um, so over this six month period from April to September last year, um, we completed 303 patient reviews. 57% um, of these reviews had at least one AMS recommendation made, uh, with 233 recommendations made overall. Um, the most common antimicrobial we reviewed was, not surprisingly, kefazolin, um, with 105 recommendations, um, and this was followed by piperacillin and tazobactam. Um, and the most common indication that we reviewed was prophylaxis for traumatic wounds. Um, this is a breakdown of the types of recommendations that we made. Um, so by far, our most common recommendation was for um, duration advice. Um, this was followed by ceasing the antimicrobial, changing the spectrum, IV to oral switch, um, and referral to expert. Um, so I thought I'd go through a few examples of some of the common um, recommendations that we were making on these rounds. Um, so like I said, prophylaxis for traumatic wounds was our most common indication that we reviewed. Um, and we found that these patients often continued um, on prolonged antibiotics, particularly if the patient was returning to theatre for multiple operations. Um, so in this case, we were recommending ceasing the antibiotics within 24 hours post-op or giving a maximum of 72 hours total. Uh, prolonged post-op antibiotics, uh, prophylactic antibiotics was another common indication that we would make a recommendation for. Um, so for example, a patient with a finger laceration, which has now been repaired, um, was being discharged with five days of oral kephalexin. Um, so in this case, we would just recommend ceasing those antibiotics post-op. Um, bites and clenched fist injuries um, often came up as well, and these patients were um, commonly prescribed piperacillin and tazobactam. Um, so in this case, our recommendation was to narrow spectrum um, down to amoxicillin clavulanate. And prophylaxis for open fractures also appeared to be an area of confusion, um, where often these patients were prescribed piperacillin and tazobactam for prophylaxis. Um, when in the TG, it is really only intended for empiric therapy. Um, so again, our recommendations were to narrow the spectrum down to kefazolin um, with the addition of metronidazole if it was heavily contaminated. Um, so this is a breakdown on the overall acceptance of our AMS recommendations. So we found that 53% of our recommendations were accepted overall. Um, and this is lower than our usual AMS rounds, um, which are sitting around 75, 80%. Um, however, of those that were actioned, 80% were actioned within 24 hours. So they were making these changes um, quite promptly. Um, we then had a look into if there were any recommendations in particular that were less likely to be accepted. Um, so this is a graph of our top five recommendations. Um, so you can see the bottom two recommendations, referral to expert and IV to oral switch, were generally fairly well accepted with 63 and 78%. Um, but it was our recommendations in regards to duration, ceasing antimicrobials and changing the spectrum, um, which were less likely to be accepted, um, sitting at around 50%. 
Um, so prophylaxis for traumatic wounds was the most common indication that we um, intervened on in regards to duration and ceasing antimicrobials. Um, and this was most commonly in regards to keprazolam. Um, for changing the spectrum, um, the majority of our recommendations were to narrow the spectrum. Um, and this was mostly in regards to de-escalating PIPTAS. So some of the reasons for non-acceptance of our recommendations were that these antibiotics were specifically requested by the surgeon. So it did put the plastics registrar in a bit of a difficult position um, and it was a bit hesitant to go against their um, direct plan. Um, we also didn't document our recommendations in the progress notes during these rounds, uh, mainly due to time constraints. Um, so all of our recommendations were verbal um, and really did rely on the registrar's memory to make these changes, um, particularly if the medication chart wasn't available at the time of the round. Um, so this is something for us to consider going forward, um, but will hopefully be made easier once we move across to the electronic medical record. Um, other limitations were that these rounds were conducted with the same plastics registrar each week. Um, so even though he did find them very valuable, um, we weren't really capturing the rest of the unit. Um, and obviously if we were spending half hour, 45 minutes on these rounds, um, this was uh, meaning that we were seeing fewer patients on our usual AMS rounds. Um, so what improvements did we see? So our 2019 um, NAPS, re NAPS results um, found that the appropriateness of prescribing in the plastics unit um, increased up to 71%. Um, and this was an improvement on 31% um, the previous year. So this is getting to be more aligned with um, the rest of the Royal Melbourne. Um, we also found that the monthly use of chloramphenicol ointment has halved um, compared to the previous year. Um, and now we find that they're mainly using it just for the eye rather than using it all over the body on other wounds. Um, we also had a look at dispensing data for Piperacil and Tazobactam on the plastics ward, um, and we have seen a small reduction in its use. Um, we also had a bit of a look at our um, Norse results um, for our PIPTAS use in the hospital overall. Um, so the graph here is our Norse data with the black line, black solid line um, representing PIPTAS use um, and our, the yellow line representing our IV amoxicillin clavulanate use. Um, so you can see that the PIPTAS use has um, come down slightly and this has corresponded with an increase in the use of IV augmenting. Um, these rounds also provided an opportunity for education and helped to facilitate direct discussion between the AMS team and the plastics registrar, um, which has previously been a barrier to improving antimicrobial prescribing in this unit. So where to from here? <laughs> So the AMS team has booked in a presentation at the plastics consultant meeting um, in the next month or so, um, during which we plan to give a presentation on the summary of the data from these rounds, um, including some of those common um, examples of the recommendations we were making. Um, we're also going to give them a bit more detail on their NAPS results from last year um, and also discussing the changes in the new therapeutic guidelines antibiotic chapter. Um, and during this, we also plan on presenting a few of the new antibiotic recommendation posters um, that our AMS team has recently made. Um, so this is an example of one of those posters. Um, so because prophylaxis for traumatic wounds came up so frequently during these rounds um, and that these recommendations were less likely to be accepted, um, we have developed this poster um, to help kind of guide prescribing in this area. Um, and we did done that in conjunction with the plastics, trauma and the ortho units. Um, so hopefully this will provide a bit more clear guidance, particularly around the duration of antibiotics antibiotics, um, which was our most common recommendation we were making for this indication. Um, we've also developed this poster for presumptive therapy for bites and clenched fist injuries. Um, and this is really just highlighting um, that PIPTAS is no longer recommended for this indication and trying to direct prescribers to use amoxicillin carbulanate um, instead. 
Um, and finally, we've also updated our surgical antibiotic prophylaxis poster. Um, so this is on display in all the theatres at Royal Melbourne um, and also on our surgical wards as well um, to help guide prescribing um, for this indication as well. And that's all I have, um, unless anyone has any questions. Okay. Thanks, Jenna. Um, we'll wait for a couple of questions. If anyone has any questions, you can um, type them in. Uh, cool, so I can see the question from Kaz. Um, so the question is, how are we doing the rounds now? Um, so yes, we're still continuing with them at the moment. Um, so at the start of this year, we had a new plastics registrar start. Um, so we're getting to do some education with him as well. Um, and now there's actually two of them. Um, so with the current situation, we're doing all of our meetings via Zoom at the moment. So I'll be... Um, with one of my consultants um, and then the plastics registrar um, has organised a Zoom meeting with us. So that seems to be going quite well. We have access to their list so he's able to kind of go through the list and we can kind of follow along plus we're all sitting at the computer and can still have access to um, all the micro um, and lab results as well. Also, if anyone would um, like to talk, I can let you do that. Um, Kaz, would you like to talk? I'll just um, allow that one second. Yep. Okay, Kaz, you should be able to speak to the uh, presenters and the attendees now. Oh, uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> wow, this is great. <laughs> um, great presentation, Jenna. And um, I've had the opportunity as the consultant to do a couple of these um, virtual rounds via Zoom just recently. Um, and I guess it gives us a taster as to how it might work once we have our own electronic record in place. But yeah. uh, from a consultant's perspective, it was really, there clearly is a, um, a real um, desire from the Plastics Fellow to um, discuss the case. And the nice thing is, is that because it's being done with the fellow directly who then um, oversees the residents, he is taking direct responsibility to pass that information onto the residents. And that includes reminding them um, about getting approvals um, and to, um, uh, to discuss um, our recommendations with his consultants. And so it's really a very um, positive experience and probably not dissimilar to the sort of um, camaraderie we have when we do our ICU rounds. And I think having a targeted, a targeted approach like this with a particular unit dedicating so a little bit of time with them each week um, will change their culture. And so I did follow up with another question about mm -hmm. to Jenna. What other units, what other um, types of units do you think that this approach might work with, in your opinion? Yeah, so we have kind of been thinking about that now because we have been doing these rounds for almost a year with the plastics unit. Um, and yeah, you're, you're right, they're very accepting of our recommendations. They're very... Um, they really, really want to do the right thing. So um, they just need that little bit of support and that bit of education. Um, so, yeah, building that relationship with the surgical team is the most important part to get these rounds going and to improve their prescribing. Um, so apart from plastics, you know, I guess we've kind of been brainstorming, you know, who else we could roll these rounds out to. And I guess our next unit would potentially be the ortho unit. Um, we've had a few kind of initial discussions with them already just kind of about their overall um, 
surgical prophylaxis prescribing um, because they were part of the surgical prophylaxis audit that we did um, last year as well. Um, So I think, yeah, once we've kind of um, finalised with our plastics um, unit, we might move on to the orthopaedics unit. Um, It is quite hard. I don't think we could really do more than one dedicated unit um, per week, so a plastics and an ortho dedicated order because we don't really um, have time and we wouldn't really see any other patients on other wards. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we're starting to think about now. Thanks, Jenna. There's a comment from Trent Yawood, so I will um, mm-hmm. just one second. Okay, um, I'll let Trent have a word, and then there's a question from Marie. Trent, if you'd like to say something. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, you're right. Uh, look, Jenna just co- covered it in her last um, uh, You know, I think AMS is all about relationships and it just goes to show that even if you've got a very difficult to engage team of recalcitrantly bad prescribers, if you actually take the time and work with them, uh, then it, it makes such a huge difference. So really, really well done to, to all of you. Yeah, I think these rounds, you know, just having the discussions and hearing what the surgeon's concerns are um, and some areas that they're a little bit confused about, um, actually sitting down and talking with them is hugely beneficial for their own education as well as for our learning as to what what they're worried about for their patients. So, um, yeah, the the area for patients who who keep going back to theatre, you know, every second day, you know, oh, they need to be on antibiotics that entire time and just kind of taking a step back and explaining to them, you know, what the risks and benefits are of being on antibiotics for a week um, just for prophylaxis. Um, That discussion really helps rather than kind of us just writing a kind of quick um, summary in the notes and not kind of having those sit down discussions with them. So that's been yeah, really beneficial. Thanks, Trent and um, Jenna. There's a question from Ree, so I'm just gonna allow Ree to have a word. Yep, perfect. Hi, Ree. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yep, okay. all good. Hi, Ree. Hi, <laughs> Hi Jenna. Um, Hi. I'm just curious, um, uh, you mentioned that PIT-TAS is no longer recommended for traumatic wounds, and I'm just wondering if that was previously recommended in therapeutic guidelines and when that changed? Um, I'm pretty sure it was. If not, it's what our surgeons always previously used. Um, maybe it wasn't particularly in the guideline, but I know now um, it's much clearer in the TG and they've got a definitive kind of prophylaxis section versus a empiric therapy section because I think there's that bit of confusion as to what are you actually using the antibiotics for, um, for someone with an open fracture? And that's a discussion that we have with these um, surgeons quite often. So are you actually treating an infection? Do you think the the wound is actually infected? Or are you just worried that it can become infected um, because our choice of antimicrobial does change in that case? Um, So having that discussion and making that differential um, between the two um, is obviously really important and something that the surgeons, I think, got a bit confused about because even um, on other rounds, so quite often on our ICU rounds, they have trauma patients who have come in, they have both these open fractures and they're on PIPTAS and Um, uh, ICU consultants have told us, oh, that's in the therapeutic guidelines. It says that we should be using PIPTAS. Um, But when we sit down and kind of show them what the guideline says, there's two separate sections. So there's one for empiric therapy and one for prophylaxis. So, um, and for the prophylaxis, it's just the kefazolam plus the metronidazole if needed. Thank you. Perfect, thanks, Jenna. Um, If there are no more questions, we can move on to the next presentation. So if you type in your questions, I can can unmute you and then you'd be able to ask them directly. Uh, But yeah, if you type in your questions, I'll be able to see that you have a question and I can can help you. Um, All right, so our next presentation is by Ron Chia, who's an AMS pharmacist and a project officer with the guidance group at Melbourne Health. His topic is fact or fiction, don't make a rash decision, assessing consumer understanding of penicillin allergies. Ron, could you share your screen and um, test your mic again? Yep. Uh, 
in your Perfect. Seat. Yep. Yep. I can see. All right. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Arjun. Morning. My name is Ron. I'm presenting to you today on our survey of consumers on their understanding of penicillin allergies. So what do we know about this topic? Uh, there are quite a lot of studies out there that have explored this among clinicians. I'll just present a few. So the first study in this list surveyed 258 inpatient providers. This study showed that the respondents had a poor baseline knowledge. It also had an educational intervention, but despite this, a proportion of respondents still were unable to recognize symptoms of hypersensitivity reactions to absolute contraindications post-intervention. This second study in the list carried out as an online questionnaire of 277 doctors and pharmacists in Australia. You might recognize the name. Found significant knowledge gaps, for example, in penicillin cross-reactivity, and this did not correlate with years of clinical experience. Another survey in China of 259 doctors, nurses, and medical students on knowledge, attitudes, and practice patterns found an overall low level of knowledge and a non-standard practice profile. There's a conference abstract from 2017 carried out as an email survey of 164 doctors and non-medical prescribers showed that the majority of respondents were likely to play it safe and avoid prescribing alternative beta-lactams in patients labeled penicillin allergic regardless of the patient's allergy history details. Another 2017 survey of 276 doctors and pharmacists, with the majority of respondents being attending physicians, demonstrated that approximately half in this study were unfamiliar with penicillin cross-reactivity rates. And there was an apparent difference in the understanding of the management of patients with a history of penicillin allergy in hospitals with limited collaborative efforts between allergy and non-allergy healthcare practitioners. The last one on this list surveyed doctors specializing in pediatric medicine in the primary care and acute care setting. Respondents in this study reported that although they may be aware that patients with low risk symptoms are able to tolerate penicillin without a reaction, they are not likely to act upon this knowledge. They were also likely to overclassify low risk symptoms as high risk and reported that they infrequently referred such patients for further detailed allergy assessments. So what about consumers? Um, there's a 1996 survey of 2,500 adult patients conducted in the ED setting. A doctor interviewed patients to obtain their allergy history and verified this against their GP record. 10% of patients in this survey claimed at least one allergy. Allergies to penicillins were the most named allergy. 40% of the reported allergies could not be confirmed by the patient's GP, leading them to the conclusion um, that many patients who believe themselves to be allergic are poorly informed about them. And lastly, this conference abstract described a survey of patients in an allergy clinic, so it's quite a narrow population in the US. It showed that the majority of these patients were unaware of the possibility of allergies being lost over time, and also reported that they were not informed by their primary care providers that penicillin allergy testing was even available. Which brings us to our study. <clears throat> There's a bit of back with an excellent updated allergy section. This section is a great resource for clinicians. We felt we could build upon this by developing a quick FAQ type reference for consumers as a resource for antibiotic awareness week. We collaborated with the sensitivity sheet and we sought consumer feedback as part of this process. We decided to add a few additional questions assessing consumer understanding of penicillin allergies on our standard feedback form so we may improve and better target our future educational content and strategies. How do we do it? Uh, volunteer pharmacists optionistically sample patients and carers at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Patients have presented the survey on penicillin allergy knowledge, then given an info sheet, and then handed the rest of the survey to record the feedback. This was conducted as a paper survey the survey collected basic demographic details, such as age and allergy status, responses to questions that assess consumer understanding of penicillin allergies. The respondents could select agree, disagree, or unsure for each question. And finally, a section for them to record feedback on the information leaflet. We surveyed a total of 44 patients to date. The average age was 53 years, and the majority of respondents did not report an allergy to penicillin. Note that five respondents reported a penicillin allergy. We'll talk about this in a sec. 
So here are the findings. Uh, this slide requires a bit of explanation. So the green text on the table to the left and the green bars on the bar graph to the right uh, indicate the correct responses for each question. The first three questions are assessing the respondent's understanding of what a true allergic reaction may be and how they may react to it. So these, these are it. Um, so question one is nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, or dizziness are symptoms of an allergic reaction. They can agree, disagree, or, or be unsure about it. Uh, question two relates to question one. Um, so if they experience any of the above, they report this as a penicillin allergy. And question three, again, relates to the first question. Uh, if they experience any of the above, they avoid penicillin in the future. So as you can see, the majority of respondents did not select the correct responses for these questions. There were more correct responses for the next two questions. Um, so the purpose of question four was to assess their understanding of whether allergies can be passed down from a parent to a child. The more correct responses here and more unsures. And question five was to assess their understanding of whether allergies may be lifelong again, similar to that fewer people agreeing, more being unsure or disagreeing with that. Question six and seven, we did. So thankfully, um, zero for that one and only two people for this one. Uh, we decided to look a little bit close at some of the responses. So this is back to question one. So question one, uh, 13 respondents selected unsure and of these 12 claim that they would report this is a penicillin allergy and eight would choose to avoid penicillin in the future. And if they had selected agree for questions one and two, uh, so if you think of that as a Venn diagram, there were 22 people in that category. 18 of these would choose to avoid penicillin and prescribing penicillin for the children as well. So back to our five respondents with the self-reported penicillin allergy. Uh, three of those agreed that nausea vomit is and four of those who report that as a penicillin allergy. So which makes you question whether these patients really had a penicillin allergy at all. And for the feedback on our the, the info leaflet, uh, we received See that you're pleased with the simplicity of this fact sheet and the bullet point layout. They also found the section explaining the difference between side effects and allergies most useful. So that was a useful um, take home point for a lot of them. We received. Um, as a child, I was not allergic to penicillin, and now as an adult, it can happen to my family. And this is my favorite penicillin could be allergic to some people. In conclusion, it's fair to say that penicillin allergy misconceptions exist and are common among consumers. Our survey has highlighted the need for better consumer focused education and also the important work that's being conducted around penicillin allergy delabeling. We started to extend the survey to other centers to capture broader representation of consumers. However, this is currently on standby given the situation of COVID-19. So the website. The Center of Antibiotic Allergy and Research also have an excellent consumer-focused fact sheet on low-risk penicillin allergies. It goes into a bit more detail, and this is also available on their website. I strongly encourage you to check these out after this. The following pharmacists who are immensely helpful with the data collection, and it's the end of my talk. Thanks, Ron. Um, if anyone has any questions, please type them in. Ron, I have a question to start with. Were these uh, consumers captured in the hospital setting or in the uh, general practice setting? All in the hospital at Royal Melbourne Hospital. Mm. It's interesting. <laughs> so what happened was um, uh, the pharmacists that, that were helped with the recruiting, um, they just... Um, try to capture patients in the ward or maybe waiting around pharmacy or in the discharge lounge um, and just collected the responses from there. So anyone who's sitting around pre-COVID. 
Yeah, that's right. Um, I think there's a bit of a lag in your audio, but I was able to cap. I was able to get most of it. Sure. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to type them in. So we're currently stuck with uh, able to survey this current situation. It'd be very interested if, if anyone had any ideas on how we may do this remotely or uh, using online forms. So SurveyMonkey has been suggested, but we just don't know what the practicality of doing, doing it that way is. So you might maybe see a patient on the ward and give them a link, you might com complete it later. I, I don't know if anyone out there might have any ideas. Be very happy to hear them. We have two questions. Cas, uh, but just yeah. question is what ethic? I can see one from Kaz. So, just we just needed um, just QA for this one. Uh, was the turnaround time was pretty quick at Royal Melbourne? I think it took about two weeks to 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 come. go through. Uh, quick patience is the other question. Um, that's not a bad idea. Um, we haven't considered that at the moment. Yeah, um, so if it's HIF, I suppose it would, it would still be considered as, I, I'll, I'll need to contact ethics about this. Um, yeah, that's a really great idea. Mm. Ron, you could repeat the questions as well for the yeah, other sure. attendees. Yep. No so um, did, you, did you answer the one about the HIF patients as well? Yeah, you did. Um, there's a question from Glenn. Yeah, um, we can uh, it's, probably it's a great idea. Mm. And also Kaz has asked a question about ethics, allowing you to contact patients at home. Yep, so um, I need to contact um, the Melbourne Health Ethics about this, but I, I reckon it should be okay because we are approved to um, survey patients, inpatients at the hospital. Technically, HIF patients would be inpatients, wouldn't they? So I think that's, um, that's a very... good suggestion okay there's a question from glenn i'm i'll unmute glenn so that he can ask you yeah hi glenn you can ask your question now hi glenn i can't hear you glenn you should be able to unmute yourself now yep perfect um good morning um Thanks, Ron. That was interesting. I was just wondering uh, how many studies there are of, of um, how many people are actually allergic when they're tested compared to how many think they are and are there demographic differences? Sorry, Glenn. I couldn't, sorry, I can't hear you, Glenn. My uh, connection is really bad. I apologise. That's all right. Um, yep. Let me... Do you want me to just uh, maybe just read the question? Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> And after that, uh, Kaz would like to um, answer that as well. But Glenn, you're, um, yep, I can see. All right, sorry. We can hear you, Glenn. Um, it was oh, okay for us. Okay. Yeah, 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 I can definitely hear you. Okay. Yep. So, so what I was wondering is, uh, are there studies to, to look at how many people who think they're allergic actually are when they're tested? And are there demographic differences between those, between the, the people who are more likely to think they're allergic when they actually aren't. That work? Hi, Ron, can you hear us? Oh, um, Ron, can you unmute yourself? Yep, I'm un unmuted. Yep. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yep. Okay, perfect. So Glenn's question was, um, how many other studies determining how many people think, yeah, think they're allergic versus um, how many have had tested allergies or their allergies tested? Has she want to answer that? 
Okay, yep, Kaz as well. Kaz, you can unmute yourself. You're able to, um, so, you're able to um, yep, perfect. So I've obviously been involved with Jason <clears throat> and his establishment to these allergy delabeling clinics, which um, are currently being run at Peter Mac and, and the Austin. And it's really quite remarkable. So the current approach now um, that we're doing is for um, all patients, all inpatients, um, if they record an if they say they have an allergy, get immediately assessed using a triage tool. If they are side effects, they're immediately delabeled on the spot. Um, if they have um, a distant um, penicillin allergy, they're offered um, oral delabeling, that admission on the spot. Um, anyone who um, then needs further assessment is referred to the delabeling clinic. Um, that approach has, is, um, has been highly successful. And actually, the the number of patients that are, are delabeled from a penicillin allergy is um, over ninety percent. Um, Glenn, your question about demographic differences um, are probably um, all through Jason's paper. I can't recall anything standing out. Um, I'm not sure whether um, in the modern era, younger younger people are more aware of. Um, allergy labels or not, but I suspect not. I think it's very, very widespread. And it really requires quite a systematic approach because labels stick and labels accumulate. And um, labels go between general practice and hospital. They get stuck on paper medical records and get transferred and transferred. So there needs to be quite a significant effort once the delabeling has done to um, provide letters to the GP, letter to the patient, um, formal um, process to ensure that the label is removed at the hospital. Um, and uh, it would be quite interesting to see over time whether these creep back again, but certainly having an allergy delabeling program, I think absolutely is should be an essential part of all hospital stewardship programs and it doesn't actually require a formal um, a formal program through the immunology so this this program that Jason has set up is essentially done um, with um, we, we're running it with a, a nurse um, uh, a, a nurse practitioner in training who's also doing the skin prick testing and the oral challenges um, the pharmacists are well and truly on board and uh, then we have an ID physician overseeing the, the challenges in hospital and uh, doing the clinics. Kaz, would you like to comment on um, the use of telehealth for qualitative research? Only that at the moment with um, the COVID, the impact on research, um, Obviously, patient-facing clinical trials have been suspended. All, all clinical trials have been suspended unless they're required for um, uh, part of um, high-risk care, for example, in the cancer space, of course. But um, in, the, in, the, in the lower risk research space, the qualitative researchers have moved to telehealth conversations or either phone call or telehealth. Um, interviews with um, patients and that apparently is working extremely well and as far as I'm aware is covered by most of their existing ethics but as um, I think it's worthwhile um, following up Ron um, but it does open up the opportunity and one of the one of the silver linings of this um, uh, period of um, restricted access, um, I think it really is uh, providing new opportunities for how we can un undertake some of our research. Thanks, Kaz. Uh, there was a comment from Re about uh, survey platforms and she recommended Qualtrics so over SurveyMonkey um, because it may be more secure and um, it may have more features. Um, if there are any other questions, please, please uh, feel free to type them in. Otherwise, Ron, I'd give you the last word and then we can close our webinar today. Thanks, Arjun.
Okay, Ron, I think maybe if you have any closing comments. Oh, um, yeah, um, no. Thank, thanks for listening to me today. Um, and if you're, if you're, anyone's interested in participating in the near future, perhaps when everything settles down a little bit more, uh, please let me know. I'm trying to um, recruit as many people as I can. So yeah, send me an email um, if you're interested. Perfect. Thank you, Ron. And thank you, Jenna, for your presentations today. Thanks everyone for attending and uh, please uh, join us next month as well. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Arjun. Thanks, Kaz. Bye.